Hello YouTube, it's Blackbeard again, um, you know, the people that know me best, uh, or know me well, and there's really not very many of them, uh, they, they know I have very odd interests, very odd things that, uh, you know, that I like to, to learn that I like to investigate um, you know I think a good example of that was my first video where I talked about the Daniel Holtzclaw case I mean that that interests me that makes me wanna you know do research and you know and it's it's kind of an odd thing to spend your time on but uh you know these kind of things uh, they interest me um, in a sense that you know, I, I, a couple of things, or, you know, one, one thing has always interested me, and, you know, I took it a lot in college, and that's psychology, and, you know, kind of how do people handle certain situations. And uh, more so for me, what fascinates me is how people handle bad situations. And, uh, you know, how do, uh, how do people react in the worst of situations? And, uh, you know, a good example of that is something that I... Uh, you know, that I did a lot of research on was, uh, was 9-11, and, uh, you know, I always kind of found that to be, I mean, that was, that was our generation's tragedy, that was the moment, you know, in, in time where, where time stood still, everybody knows where they were, everybody remembers how they felt on that day, and how it affected them personally. Um, but, you know, and, and we all know the familiar stories and, uh, you know, four planes were hijacked with intention to crash into major buildings. Uh, three of them were successful. One crashed, you know, one crashed into each of the Twin Towers, one crashed into the Pentagon, and one crashed in a field in Pennsylvania after the passengers fought back. You know, everybody's familiar with the stories and how the two towers fell. Um... What I wanted to know is I wanted to dig a little deeper and kind of, uh, you know, kind of piece the whole day together, you know, kind of look into the specifics, you know, the, down to the more detail, you know, what happened and more importantly, what must have it been like for the people who were actually involved, who were actually there. And, uh, you know, and I have done research and I have come up with some very... Um, surprising details, a lot of things that a lot of people don't know, a lot of things that um, make me think differently about what happened, and a lot of things that honestly make me question what the actual story, what the actual, um, you know, the actual story that we were given, uh, you know, about what happened on that day. So I'm going to do a, a a video series, you know, on different aspects of 9-11, kind of get down into more detail and explain, you know, what I feel like it must have been like for the people who were involved, uh, pieces of the story that don't necessarily add up, you know, and I want to focus on the parts of like that, that nobody will ever know, and for example, Nobody will ever know what it was like to be on one of those planes that were hijacked. There were bits and pieces that we will know, and it's based on, uh, you know, phone calls, uh, air traffic control recordings, which are all on YouTube, and I have heard them. They are compelling. Um, they will send shivers down your spine. They have the actual, re actual recordings, the air traffic control recordings of the planes as they were being hijacked, uh, it's chilling, it really is, and, uh, you know, the one I want to focus on today is, uh, the first plane that was hijacked, the first plane that was crashed, and that was American Airlines Flight 11, uh, the story of, uh, American Airlines Flight 11 is that it was hijacked at 8.14 a.m. on September 11th, and, it was uh, hijacked by five hijackers. 
led by a man named Muhammad Atta, who was considered to be the ringleader of the hijackers. He was also a trained pilot, and uh, he flew the plane into One World Trade Center at 8.46 a.m. Um, and in a lot of ways... American Airlines Flight 11 hitting Tower 1 was the biggest tragedy of the day. More people died due to that by far than anything else. You know, people look at the two buildings and say, okay, well, Building 2 was hit further down. More people were affected. No. Uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, uh, a lot of Building 2 had been evacuated of course, I'm gonna, I'll get into that in a different video, but um, the thing about Building 1 is that when the plane hit, it uh, destroyed all exits out of the building. It shut down the elevators. All of the emergency exits were completely blocked off. It basically, if you were above the crash site, you died. And uh, I, it's almost half of the people that died were in the top 12 floors of that building. Um... Cantor Fitzgerald was a, a financial firm, lost 700 or so people. Uh, the restaurant Windows in the World was hosting a breakfast banquet uh, for some company that morning, lost over 100 people, including cooks and uh, managers of the restaurant and the people who went to the banquet. Uh, and there was one other building, and I apologize to anybody who was associated with. There was another company of the, you know, that had the main floors that were hit. I don't know what they are off the top of my head. I apologize if I offend anybody for not knowing that. Uh, but that was the most tragic. I think somewhere around 1,400 people died due to that plane hitting alone in a day that claimed a little under 3,000 people. So again, it was almost half. Um, let me start with a few oddities about Flight 11. Um, the, the number one thing that jumps out to me is I've watched in, or a video and listened to the air traffic recordings from the day. And you, when you literally listen to it, the air traffic controller gives two commands to Flight 11. He says, American 11 uh, turned 20 degrees right, and it was responded. 20 degrees right, American 11, which is standard, and the flight started to turn. Literally, you can count it, and I've done this, I've counted it, it takes about 12 seconds, and we're going to do that right now. We're going to count 12 seconds, because I want you to get an idea as to how long it is. We're going to start right now. Twelve seconds. About as long as it takes for me to take a hit off my cigarette and throw it away. It. And the reason I twelve seconds is important is that literally, twelve seconds later, air traffic control gives another command to American Airlines Flight 11 and says, American Airlines climbed to uh, level three five zero, which is thirty five thousand feet. There is no response. And he asks again. American Airlines, or American 11 climbed flight level 350. No response. It's assumed that in that 12 seconds, the hijacking took place. 12 seconds. Now, I, I, we need to think about this for a minute. Or what it would take. Uh, the two muscle hijackers we're sitting in the second row in first class. I, w I want you to think about the process it would take for them to get up, get into the cockpit, get the pilots out, which probably all of those things would need to happen in order for them not to respond. At least just that's just the theory of mine. You, 12 seconds. We gotta think they gotta get up and immediately they're gonna run into the flight attendants. They need to make some kind of threat to the flight attendants. They need to get the flight attendants to open the door. They need to threaten the pilots. The pilots need to stand up. All of this stuff, you know, in best estimate, it'll take 
30 seconds if everything for them works perfectly. Now that doesn't make any sense to me that there was no mayday calls, there was no sounds of struggles, there was nothing like that. The plane didn't rise or dip in altitude, it didn't turn violently. It flew, it did its 20 degree turn, it straightened out, textbook, nothing out of the ordinary. They didn't know anything was out of the ordinary other than the fact that they weren't responding for maybe 10 minutes. Which brings me to oddity number two, that Muhammad Atta made an announcement. And again, this is all recorded. You can find it on YouTube. You can look it up. This is fact. He made an announcement to air traffic control. Now, it's thought that he did not do this on purpose, that his intention was to make an announcement to the people on the plane using the loudspeaker. And then he hit the wrong button and announced it to air traffic control. He made three different announcements, and they were basically all the same. And say, his first one was, we have some planes. Everybody stay calm. We're on our way back to the airport. Now, this is thought to be intended to be directed towards the passengers so that they don't freak out. At this point, they they know that the plane's been hijacked, that everybody was pushed to the back of the plane, nobody was allowed in the front of the plane, and he was, because he was trying to give them false hope that, look, we hijacked the plane, we have our demands, we're going back to the airport. It's odd that as a trained pilot, he made that mistake, because there's no reason for him to make that announcement over the loudspeaker. I always found that very odd. There's a lot of similarities there. Actually, the flight uh, Zaid Jara on Flight 93 did the exact same thing. And Flight 93 is a whole story, and again, I'll make a whole other video on that. But it, it, it just seems odd to me that those two things happened the way that they did. How did they get the plane so easily? And how and why did he announce that over air traffic control how did he not know as a trained pilot what how to connect to air traffic control why would he say anything to the crew via the speaker anyways there were four other guys on the plane four other hijackers they could easier easily relate a message there was no reason for him to do that um, you know, there are conspiracy theorists, and I'm not saying I'm one of them. I'm telling you the facts, and I'm telling you how they make me feel, and it makes me feel a little uneasy. But there are conspiracy theorists that say that these were fake recordings made to kind of make people believe the official story. I don't necessarily believe that. I don't know. All I'm telling you is that I find it odd that, that, the, that those, those announcements were made. He made three different ones. And he must have been wearing the headset if he made that announcement, or they must have, he must have heard the radio and known that when he made this first announcement that air traffic control heard it and was trying to respond to it. So why would he make the other two? Why couldn't he figure out then that he was making these announcements over air traffic control and not to the passengers on the plane? Because obviously there's not a radio that will connect to both at the same time. Um... You know, the other thing about Flight 11 and, and Tower 1 that always just bugged me was the fact that I think it was CBS had footage, and this is all on YouTube as well, that was footage of the first building after it was hit with the plane. And people were, or you know, and it was before the second plane had hit. So it was somewhere between like 8.50 and 9 o'clock in the morning. And they were showing footage of the smoke pouring out of the building. And you could see two different people jumping out of the tower. Now, I kind of thought I would do a video on its own about jumpers. It's a very compelling, very heartbreaking story about 9-11. There was as many as 200 people jumped out of the building. But one thing that I always found odd is... What what would cause you to jump out so soon? What would cause you... What could have possibly been going on up there in that building that would make you realize five to ten minutes in after the plane hit that you were dead 
and that if you stayed up there, you would die and had to jump out of the building. So, uh, you know, it's just it's just something to think about. And uh, that's again, that's another an that's another question that will never be answered. Nobody will know what it's what it was like on those floors because again, everybody who was at or above the crash site in Tower One died on that day. Um, uh, my theory is that you know, my my theory on 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 the people that were above the crash site that the last contact that anybody had with anybody above the crash site was a call that came from Windows in the World about 9.17 a.m. It was about a half an hour, or a little more than a half an hour after the plane hit, where they were calling and screaming for help. There was never, there was never any more contact with anybody in Cantor or Windows in the World after that. I had about eight, 900 people up there, roughly. My theory is that by about 9.20 a.m. they were all dead smoke inhalation most likely or they jumped out um and it's just and you know it's we've all we've all seen the footage we've all seen the footage of of you know the of the towers burning and it's just kind of strange to think that if you're looking at a video clip of the two buildings sitting there burning and it's 9 30 then you know all of those people are just laying up there already passed on you know the these are the uh these are the stories that that people don't think about people don't drill into and these are the stories that i find horrifying but fascinating and and important that we need to know cuz i mean these things actually did happen uh i'm sorry if this was a little morbid for you um this has just always been a an important subject for me to know as much as i can about um I hope that, uh, you know, this makes you kind of look at the whole situation a little differently. And, you know, we just went over one aspect of it. One of the planes, there were four planes that day. And every single one of those actions have their weird little stories that, that occur behind it. Uh, weird little inaccuracies that don't seem to make sense. Uh, and tragic stories that people tend to ignore. You know, and I think that... uh you know these are these are things that I don't know why I really can't explain it to you, but I think they're important. Though uh, I'm gonna finish this up with the last and and in my opinion the scariest and w most horrifying story about 9/11 in general, uh, and it, it it is a Tower One story, and it actually it was occurred in both towers, but. Um, and I and I and you'll hear this in the newscast, and if you do research on it, uh, you'll you'll learn that this this actually did happen. Uh, I mean, as a lot of people know, uh, these were some of the busiest buildings in the world. Uh, they had this very um, modernized, huge elevator system in these buildings, and uh, these massive room-sized elevators that brought people up and down the buildings and this was a work day this was happened on a Tuesday and this and it was right around rush hour people were going in when the planes hit the elevator shut down and when the and when the elevator shut down the doors wouldn't open that's the scariest thought that I have in regards to 9-11 that the worst possible scenario, in my opinion, for anybody on that day was imagine you are in a room-sized elevator. That elevator is full. You are shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder with maybe 60 people or more. I don't know, a lot. All The elevator's going up to your floor. You're going to work. Bam. You hear this explosion, violent shake. The doors won't open. You are literally stuck there for 102 minutes. That's how long the North Tower burned before it collapsed. 102 minutes you are trapped in this room, shoulder to shoulder, until eventually you feel a rumble and the ceiling caves in. I mean, that's just the scariest thought I can imagine is for the people in those elevators. Um, but anyways... Uh, Again, 
sorry for the morbid subject, but to me, to me it's important. Uh, I hope somebody uh, got something out of this. I'm going to go ahead and post this. Uh, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just telling stories. Peace.